In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you this morning as we celebrate and hear the Word of God uh, and celebrate Holy Communion together in this very uh, new way. It's become the new normal. Well, today we encounter in Matthew the parable of the sower. And the parable of the sower is one of those stories that may be familiar to some of us and, and not familiar to others. But it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, parable uh, about the Word of God. And as like any good parable, and this is what we have to remember, we can find ourselves in different points in the parable. In other words, we could be the sower. We can be the soil. We can even be the birds or the things that snatch it away. We might even be the sun. Uh, there's so many different ways, and that's what makes parables so powerful, is as the more you read them, the more you can find yourself at different points uh, in a parable. Now, many years ago, I was serving in, in South Georgia in, in farm country. And I remember talking to a farmer, uh, a good old Christian farmer. And uh, we got to talking about parables and, and, and it was, uh, we were coming up to this parable, just like we are today to, to preach on. And I, and I asked him, I said, what's your thoughts on the parable of the sower? And he looked at me and he said, bad business bad farming. Those are what he told me. And then I, you know, and he kind of laughed, but he, then he went on to say, you know, if you really read it and the way I think about farming today, he said, is that we don't just scatter seed anywhere. It is all calculated. So much of our, our livelihood depends on our ability to create the best soil, the best opportunity for the seeds that we have to buy to grow. And this particular farmer had uh, organic fields and non-organic fields and and the preparation for the organic fields was so much more intense than it was for the non-organic fields and the margins for farmers are so slim and they're one of the few professions that I don't think many of us think about that have to work 24 7 so that when you and I go to the grocery store we're able to pick from so many different things and so much of their livelihood starts with that seed starts with the ability to plant those seeds in the right spot. So you have to imagine that even in the first century when Jesus shared this parable that anybody who farmed, when they were listening to this, it probably seemed ridiculous, outlandish, that anybody would take something so valuable as seeds and just fling them everywhere, knowing that some were gonna land in bad soil, some were gonna land on rocks, and some were gonna get choked out by weeds because the soil hadn't been prepared. And that only a small margin would land on good soil. And that's the first layer, I think, in this parable is really, and this is, I think, one of the hardest things we do as Christians is accept that the kingdom of God is bigger than the kingdom of this world. It's bigger than what we think about, than what we imagine that the kingdom of God and what Jesus is preaching is reversals and he's preaching abundance that God came into human existence in the form of Jesus in abundant love for the creation that God created. And that in God's eyes, throwing those seeds everywhere is exactly what the kingdom of God is about. It's what we're called to do. Another layer to this parable I think that's important is the soil itself. And of course, this is where a lot of preachers, and this is where I've gone in the past, where we spend a lot of time talking about how do we make ourselves the good soil? How do we, how do we turn ourselves into soil that's going to bear fruit? Because of course, in our good way, we want to bear fruit. We want to know we accomplished something. And the reality is, the more I read this story, the more I read Matthew, the more beautiful and wonderful and mysterious it is and hard that it is to accept that at any point in my life, I've been every type of soil presented in this passage that I know I have been shallow. I know that I have been rocky and dry. I know that I've been so many things that have been contrary to growing the kingdom of God. Now I can look and, and blame it on my sinfulness, blame it on my fallen nature. I mean, we have a lot of uh, words that we use to, to justify our, our actions. And I use plenty of them all the time in my sermons. And I don't dismiss that we are uh, we are not Jesus, and I, I'm acutely aware of that. But we also are capable of great and wonderful things that we don't need to use excuses to just acknowledge that we messed up, 
that we made a mistake, that we're living contrary to what God calls us to do. And that's just part of life. But each day we wake up and we realize, what does the kingdom of God demand of us? What does God simply ask us to do? And this is where I think we make it so complicated. And I'm not sure where the blame falls for that or if it matters that we blame anybody at all except ourselves. What does it mean to love God? This is what Jesus commands of us, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourself. It seems to me if we live into those two realities, And just think for a moment about all the things that we do that aren't those two things. All the judging that we do, all the dividing that we do, all the little things that we do under the banner of some kind of faith that aren't or in contrast to those. I mean, gosh, Jesus dealt with this very early on with the Pharisees. And I always remind you that the Pharisees themselves, some who would be hearing this parable, were like us, they had great intentions, they inherited a beautiful law, but yet they missed the point of what the law was about. So even though these little things they were doing, these divisions that they had created, these things they had done for personal gain, or these things they had done because they believed they were more righteous than the rest, actually were not in line with what God intended for them to do. And we'd be naive to think that at different points in our lives that we have not been just like the Pharisees, that we too find ourselves in that spot. I can think of countless examples in my life where I presumed I was more righteous than somebody else, or I presumed that I had the better interpretation of scripture, or I presumed that those folks were out and I was in. We've all been there. And each time we do that, we move from the good soil to some other kind of soil whether it be the dry, the rocky, whatever the case may be, we become that soil. Jesus simply reminds us that to love God and to love our neighbor is to create the fertile ground for the word of God to come alive in such a powerful way that it grows within us, these beautiful trees of love and life that others can find shade and find nesting and find growth and to find shelter. This is all Jesus asks of us to love each other, to build bridges of unity, to create a world that is full of harmony and life and love. And I think the last layer to this parable, uh, equally as important as the second, or maybe equally as important as the other two I've just highlighted, is being the sower, being the one who throws the seed. How do we proclaim the good news? What does that look like in our lives? What do we go out and do? I heard a story one time about uh, some folks who went to visit a local juvenile detention center. And this was politicians, religious leaders, uh, uh, some foundation executives who were going to look at this uh, program that they had, had implemented in this juvenile detention center. I believe this was in South Carolina. And as they were walking through, looking uh, at the different places and a judge took them on a tour a juvenile judge who was in charge of this new program took them on the tour. They saw all these eyes peering back at them through the bars, all different ages. And some of these children had done some heinous acts, terrible, horrible things. Some had done little things, but here they were staring back at them. And as they toured, they learned that many of these children who were in this detention center had never had an adult who showed them any kind of love or nurture that they were completely devoid of any kind of symbol of love in their life. They didn't even know uh, what love was. And one of the, uh, the participants in this tour stopped at one of the cells where he saw these little eyes peering out and he just leaned in and he said, God loves you. He didn't know what was gonna come of it. And he still to this day doesn't know what came of it, but he felt the need given everything that they had seen on this tour to just let this one child know that God loves them. Shortly after that experience, they uh, were standing in a spot and several of these adults broke down crying. One just sobbing profusely and the judge stopped her tour and she looked over her shoulder and saw this and she came back to him and she said, I know, I understand. And perhaps that in itself is the greatest witness of who Jesus and God is to us. 
Because that person remarked that if I ever have to be judged, I want to judge like that. I want to judge like that. Who willingly throws seed everywhere. Doesn't look out on the human condition and say, these folks are worthy and these folks are not worthy. These folks are somehow right and these folks are somehow wrong. God flings the seed everywhere. We too are invited to fling the seed everywhere. To be a place where God can happen for somebody else. To be that in the lives of all the people that we meet. To not be the judge of every single person that we meet. To not look at everybody that we meet and decide right off the bat that we don't love them or they're not worthy because of X, Y, and Z. But to be the unconditional lover, to be the conduit of Jesus' love and Jesus' unconditional love of us out into the world. That is what it means to be the sower, the one who throws the seed with great joy and compassion and hope and life, flinging our seed everywhere we can and meeting everyone where they are in hopes that maybe God working through us will do incredible things with them. But the reality is in order for that to be successful, we have to embrace who we are in God's eyes, nurture that, and then let that shine forth. Not in a judgmental way, not in a condescending way, not in a I'm right and you're wrong kind of way, in a simple way that says, I'm wrestling with my relationship with God. I want you to come wrestle with me. The parable of the sower shows us so much about life in the kingdom of God. And it shows us so much about how much God loves us that God would willingly throw seed everywhere so that we can have life and that we can grow in the full stature of Christ. So my brothers and sisters, I hope as we live into these times that you will look for creative ways to throw your seed out. Look for places where you thought your seed was not going to be thrown out because you had deemed it unworthy and go to those places. Go there. Go to those very places where you know you need to learn more about God through a relationship with somebody or through understanding a group of people. Go wrestle with what God is doing in that place. Join God in that work by developing God within you and letting your light shine before others so bright that the world can see. Amen.